Welcome once again. Um, this is our part two of breaking down the budget 2021. I don't know how you, you are referring or you are doing in terms of understanding the very nuggets of the 2021 budget. We started with taxation. We went through it. And today we want to begin to look at expenditure and the various areas that, you know, we have to pay as a country. Interest payment has become a very big issue, which is also the second largest item as far as expenditure is concerned on our budget after, you know, salaries and emoluments that we have on the budget. So in terms of compensation that we are doing is the biggest. You come to interest payment and then you can go to the next uh, various items that we have on it. We still have with us um, the former finance minister who is also the executive director of PFM Tax Africa Network. And um, we are welcome you again to the PFM Tax Television where we sought to educate you for you to understand what the budget is and the very things that you should take note. We've had people say Ghana is broke. We don't know why they are saying that. But we're going to have Mr. Setepe take us through um, or walk us through all the very minute details in the area of expenditure areas and then look at the big mix as far as the budget is concerned. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for joining You're us welcome. again. You're welcome. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, let's, let's <laughs> now quickly move from the taxation issues that we spoke about the last time we, we spoke. Now, let's look at expenditure. Some have said that if you look at the revenues that are coming in, this will be the expenditure. It then widens the deficit that we have. And the question has been, how do we deal with it? Now, let's look at our, our expenditures for 2021 realistic. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll start with some, you know, breaking down you know, for the uh, audience to understand a bit of what we're talking about, those who may not be. So if those who understand can, you know, um, exercise some patience, you know, with this. Uh, it's like a household. Um, you earn income. The income may come from various sources. It may be one, let's assume we have children in the house who are <clears throat> dependent. So it may be the father working, salaried worker, and bringing in, you know, some income. So that would be the first source, is the salary income, when the person is paid, plus allowances. Um, then mom may also be working, maybe trading, or maybe taking care of a kiosk next to the house. A variety. So since we have used salary for the for you know, the, the dad, let's use, let's say, trading, generally, yeah. whether sophisticated or simple, kiosk or shop or... Um, that type of income is profit because it's not sales. You have your capital, you go and buy goods, you sell. It's the difference between the selling price and the purchases, the things you buy and the expenses, taking transport, buying petrol if you have a car, is a difference as a profit. So that is another source of income to the family. If you are lucky to have uh, inherited maybe a house or something which is rented, or you yourself are endowed and you have a second house which you rent, rent may be another income. Now, the income is spent on various things. Food, it could also be on school fees, it could be on rent if you don't own, you know, the house yourself, it could be electricity on, on mortgage, That's electricity, the all precisely, that. all the things that we know. Now, the difference between the money that's coming in and the money going out, right, determines whether you have to borrow or not. If the money coming in is exhausted before the children have to go to school, typically you would go and borrow, go to the bank or something, right? So the difference between for a household, the money coming in and going out, whether if the money coming in is more than the money going out, then we say you have a surplus. Sure. If the money 
going out is more than the money coming in. You have a shortfall. Shortfall. And that's what's called deficit. Deficit, yeah. Uh, we don't hear surplus much when we talk about government because um, developing countries invariably have, you know, less income than the expenses on which they spend. Vis-a-vis so the kind of projects <clears throat> that they need to undertake. Yes, so it's often deficit. But countries like households may plan for a deficit, right? You can plan for a deficit. So if I, we decide as a household, we want to build a house or we want to buy a house, we do not have the money, 250000 to buy the house immediately. You either build over time with your income or you can decide to borrow to buy the house, which is a mortgage. Sure. In that case, you will be your expenses, including the payment for the house, would exceed your income for a long time to come, unless your business flourishes and you can pay off or you are promoted. Even if uh, typical of employees, even if you are promoted, it's unlikely that you know, they, it can uh, pay for the house. So that is planning for a deficit. You'll be in a deficit for, let's say, five years, ten years, until you finish paying for the house, for the car, you know, for the furniture. There's no more household things that we buy. Countries also plan. For example, let me use a Ghana, typical Ghanaian example. We said that let's put some of the oil revenue aside to develop the country. Assuming that that revenue coming is, let's say, 100 million, right? And you need to do a project which will cost 500 million. Which means that 100 million per year, you need five years over time. Five years. Take it off for you the cost. Exactly. So you can decide that every year when the 100 million come, you know, we do an aspect of the project. Sure. The only thing is that it will take you five years to have your oil refinery. It will take you Meanwhile, your gas is waiting for you, yeah. right? Like we did a trouble, so we borrowed from CDB. This is, again, planned investments which may result in a deficit. In that case, because you are not putting all, sorry, alternatively, you can borrow the 500, finish the project within a year, and the project itself will contribute towards the repayment. So you can repay in a shorter period of waiting for five years. Because you finish the project early, you know, you may be able to repay. That's a a project that is um, one that can be used to generate revenue. Generate revenue, yes. But even if it doesn't generate revenue, like school, you know, specifically primary school or even some secondary schools and universities, we are investing in people who will pay taxes one day. In the future. In the future, you know, to repay. So that's how you also plan for expenditure. And many of the advanced countries, which can even do projects in a shorter period because they are rich and prefer to borrow, to finish a project, to finish the road, to finish the refinery, to finish, you know, the expansion of the airport, right? Finish as quickly as possible. Then you plan, you know, to repay. Now, the repayment amount plus the interest becomes part of your annual budget. Sure. So when we are talking about interest, going high and all that, you know, in like wages and then the repayment, which is called amortization. The repayment of the loan is when you pick the budget and you see amortization in, in, the, in financing. That is what, in the financing section, that is what the loan we have taken. That's the repayment. Okay. So you can see from the structure we discussed like a household is that the nation earns revenue, in this case taxes, and then sometimes income and fees, which we call non-tax. It also earns revenue from grants. Grants, yeah. You know, uh, foreign countries and others, you know. And then it pays salary, it pays interest, you've gone over. Then it's, it pays for running government offices. It pays for running hospitals, schools, you know, and the rest. It pays, you know, for school feeding and all those things. Then it pays for capital. It pays for projects yeah. where we borrow. So typically, for countries, when we say a country is sustainable, 
when you say a country's budget is sustainable. Let me simplify it. It means you are able to generate enough income and typically not to borrow okay. to pay wages, not to borrow to pay interest. Interest, okay. Because remember, you borrowed for the interest, so and it's, it's payment of, of a loan. It's, 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 it's payment you are making for borrowing. So you shouldn't be borrowing to pay interest. You shouldn't be borrowing for running government offices. You shouldn't be borrowing, you know, for some little capital projects which can be finished within a year and which may be inexpensive. These are the elements of expenditure. I see. So what so, you should borrow, uh -huh. sorry, what you should borrow for are big projects. Big projects. And then the repayment of the interest and the loan element that you are repaying, right? If you borrow 500, interest will add to it, let's say 100, and it becomes 600. 600 or probably 650. 650. Sometimes can even hit 700, be, depending yes. on the okay. rate uh, right. that you get. Okay. So at 650 for five years, if it were 100, you pay 100. At uh, 600, it's divided by... Uh, and you want to pay within the same five years, it means that you are going to pay a higher amount. That is the principal 100 plus the interest yeah. spread over the period. Ordinarily, either your project or your taxes should be enough to pay for these two items also. We mentioned interest already. Yes, yeah, sure. Otherwise, you'll be borrowing to pay the loan which you borrowed. That's what is called refinancing, Good. reprofiling, when you hear those words. Okay. Okay, honorable. Now, I mean, just because of time, I mean, I, I, I want us to. We've done some bit of explanation. I'm sure. That yes, I want the background so that when our, we are our, discussing, our, our, our viewers uh, by this time have an understanding of you know what, uh, like the household, the context and, in which, the context in which we're going to be speaking. Yes. So that brings me to the question that if me as a household, many years we've heard from government officials, we've heard from finance experts that. And they use that term, cut your coat according to your size. You don't spend the money you don't have. How is it difficult for a government to understand that basic principle that if me a household, I will not spend what I don't have? Why is it difficult for the government to do so? Well, that you always create what you call the deficit, huge enough. that you have to also go back and borrow <coughs> to refinance a maturing debt. That is existing. You know, it's, it's government is sometimes like a household. Um, when you have peers, right, you have, you have peers, and they are doing things you know you cannot do, and yesterday you want to impress. You know, your income may not be able to sustain, let's say, a car may not be able to sustain, you know, and you go into those kind of things. I'm not saying that government seeks these decisions deliberately, but some households may not be. Or you may also, like a household, you may decide that, oh, you are okay, you are buying, you are able to pay for the vehicle, and then that loses the job. It becomes difficult, right? Uh, because then it's only one income from mom working over time and all that. Often with governments uh, in our current environment, some of it may come from, you know, winning power, you know, and overpromising. And therefore, you promise to do things beyond the capability, you know, of, you know, the, uh, of the income that is coming in from GRE. And if you come to power, you cannot get GRE to rev up the revenue, right? Then the past loan plus the present one to meet the expenditure promises and things, right, begins to create that kind of problem, you know. And the problem is that Often the problem is very simple. The deficit widens. <clears throat> because if GRS income, you know, uh, the revenue is bringing is 100, and we, expenditure is 110, and the 10 being what we need to repay loans and interest, you know, which we, and we're able to cover this, GRE may be able to raise that for 210, right, to cover all of this. And then when you borrow, Right, you make sure that if you borrow 
Euripe, so that Euripe may remains around the 10, because the capability of GRA is between 100 and 110, right? If you go beyond 220, 230, you are getting into trouble. Okay. Because there are, there's additional 10, 20, 30, you know, which is coming as a result of expanding expenditure, okay. you know, which may not, you may not be able to pay. Okay. And at that point, just like your neighbor calling, knocking on the door at dawn, because he wants to make sure he catches you before you go to work to collect the money, the amount that is owed, our creditors also begin to knock on the door. But it's fatal for a country to default, because if you just as it's, it's fatal, I said the last time that <clears throat> if you borrow from your neighbor to take your kids to school and you don't pay, you can't go back again to borrow a second time and the child may be at home, right? Sure. Or the ne neighbor may come and embarrass you with the same thing. So when we say uh, there's consequence for defaulting in paying, it applies to governments. So if the government, you know, extends itself, you know, spends more than it's capable of repaying, especially interest and the debt component, uh, or it may end up owing salaries. Yeah, very well. So now let's yes. go into the uh, 2021 budget itself. Revenues over some 72 billion total revenue from the GRE side. And, uh, That's GRE plus. Exactly. The tax revenue is GRE. Exactly. Yes. So, you, so this one, 72 inclusive grants. Grants, yeah. <clears throat> so you're looking at 72 billion, what we are bringing in. This will be an expenditure that is over 100 billion. Yes. And that was why I asked the very first question I asked that. How realistic is this? Because first of all, you're a tax person. We want to start from if you think um, the GRE themselves will be able to meet their target in terms of the revenue that they're supposed to bring in. We know that they have what we call the stretch revenue and the actual revenue. I don't know what the stretch is. I don't know whether if it's the stretch that is being used in the budget, and you'll be able to help us to understand if when you, you read budgets, do you use the stretch revenues or stretch is something that GRA itself decides to you know put to ensure that they can whip their staff to help them meet the target. No, you expect the economy to grow. And to the extent that you expect the economy to grow, and you expect even your expenditures, the current one, to be hit by inflation. Remember, government also is hit by inflation. Sure. Government imports. So government is also hit by, you know, uh, depreciation of the city, which leads to higher imports. You know, so you may have had expenditures of 100, right, last year. But to carry on the same activities, you may need a revenue of 110, right? That is sustaining inflation. But you may also point to GRA that what you call the growth, the real growth, because we have oil, we have so well, the economy is expanding. So beyond the 110, I'm expecting you to collect 115 or 120. Maybe 115 is what they are able to. So the issue then becomes, you know, one of, you know, making GRA recognize. And they themselves know that when inflation hits, for you to get the same 100, you have to do 110. When the city depreciates, otherwise you'll be, you'll be doing rendering government services at 80, not 100, right? Then to make GRA appreciate that the economy is growing, services sector is growing, you have to look for the services sector guys to contribute their tax. Uh, we have oil. Yes, we know the portion that's coming to PRMA, but we know caterers, we know service providers, we know others, you know, in the industry, which is new. We we'll go after them, register them, issue them routine, and collect money. So we say that commensurate with the growth of the economy, we think you can collect additional 10. They, they also have the analysts. They have a very solid, sound research department. So they come back and they will say, uh, we think this is a bit of a stretch, right? That's what the expression is, a bit of a stretch. We think we can do 115, 118, right? So you may then throw in as many and say, okay, between 115 and 120, 
you achieve 120, you get a bonus. So it's just like a business, right? But, but so you do a deal. Good. Right. You are not saying go and harass a taxpayer, but we're saying go and look for those who are not paying. To pay. You, you said yes. something that brings to mind time value of money. Yes. Okay, so last year you made <clears> 100. <throat> and now because of depreciation and inflation, we're saying that to get the value of the same 100, you need to do 115. Yes. So invariably, they haven't actually upped their revenue. It's like you are collecting the no, same hundred... value for us. No, at 110, they are yeah. collecting the same. Yeah, exactly. But at 115, okay, at they are not collecting... Yes. Exactly. But at 115, so... they are not collecting the same. They exactly. are growing. So they've grown and... by a percentage yes. there about. But there's another reason you may also want them to grow bigger. Okay. One, not enough people are paying taxes. Two, you have become a middle-income country. You are no longer getting grants. You are no longer getting soft loans, what you call soft loans. So you are borrowing uh, at rates that are higher than you used to borrow before, right? So you would want GRA to increase what you call the revenue effort, you know, to, to bring in. So now you are looking at your middle-income countries, right? You are looking at countries like Korea, you know, because you are slightly below, you've left in developing, but you have not also reached full middle income, but you are setting so a lower target. Middle income. Lower middle income. That's where expression comes from. But so you are looking, let's say in Africa, you are looking at South Africa, you know, which is a middle income country, you know, um, the well known one uh, in Africa. Or you are looking to Middle East, you are looking to, when you see their development, to, to reach that level, GRA will have to hear. There is something in the economy which is not making us, which is informal, which is not throwing them out. So you supply them, in this case, with electronic means of identifying taxpayers when they do trading and others, so that you boost your revenue from, let's say, 15% of GDP to 17.5%, which is where Africa, top African countries are, and we used to be there because of rebasing, or even to 20 plus, which is where the middle income countries are. So here is a genuine effort. But that type of increase takes time. So you give them three to five years. And that's where they do their strategic plan. They tell you how they are going to do it, the investments they will need. But back to revenue and expenditure. <clears throat> so you will see that where our revenue is 110, okay, it should have been 70 from the example. You, you, from the rear budget. Yeah, the rear budget is talking about 72 70. billion. Yes, but, so where you are at 70, right? Remember that we did 63. Sure. And even we did 53 because of COVID. We did spring COVID crisis and others and how they affect the budget. I don't want to confuse you with this. So it is a stretch to come from 53, 54, which was a revised target for COVID. In the, the medium budget last yes. year. To reach the original budget level of 63 billion, okay. which was in the 2020, that was original. Original, yeah. And then add another 10. 10, which then brings you them to, to the 72, 73. Yes. 72, 73. 73, yes. yes. Yeah. There's a 73 to simplify it, you know, because 63, 53, 63. So let's assume it's here. 73, okay. <clears throat> right. Because it's 72.5. Exactly. So you are telling GRA, we gave you 63, but on account of the fact that COVID came, uh, the airport was closed, businesses were shut down for a period, uh, and even now businesses are not returned to their fullest. Um, we think with the recovery that is coming, you can do 63, back to where you should have been last year. But we also think that with vaccine and others that have come, right, if you had done the 63 and the recovery gains team, we wouldn't be at 63, we would probably be at 73, you know, or maybe 68. Okay, so this is the sort of, you know, uh, 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 discussion that goes on in, in budget discussions with GRA and the other institutions. Remember I said non-tax and others. Well, so some of it all is, are we able, because on current performance, yeah. as you said, we are, remember what I said of households and governments. Government, yeah. You should be able to cover wages 
and allowances. allowances. It's the two that we call compensation, compensation. For those who may want to know, yeah. when you add the two, then it's compensation. Another, you know, employee cost. Yes. It's total, comp total compensation. Total compensation yeah. You should be able to cover that from your tax revenue. You should be able to cover interest from your tax revenue. But you should be... Yes, I'm coming to you. Yeah. So you, let's so jump. Let's bring the audience. We'll bring it, yeah. Yes. You should be able to wages and allowances from your tax revenue or your revenue. Uh, interest, interest payments, payments from your revenue. The same revenue, okay. Running government offices and from other things revenue. from your revenue. Repayment of old loans, amortization from your the revenue. The matured ones. The matured ones. Okay. If at that point you begin to borrow, it is logical. Because most borrowing is for capital. So you say that's It's for development expenditure. Okay. So that is sustainable. Provided, you know, you continue to perform that way and your interest and the debt repayment will be covered, will continue to be covered. The situation we are in now is that the, those two items, interest and uh, compensation, right, are already exceeding tax revenue. That we tax revenue. And they are about 98 or 95 percent, or so certainly about 90 percent of total revenue, revenue which yeah. includes grants. But the reason why this itself is as dangerous as going beyond your tax revenue is that you are talking about gross revenue. There are certain statutory payments that we have to make from that gross revenue. You have to pay, you have to give money to get fund, you have to give money to NHI, you have to, well, we sometimes do total budgeting, so you, those expenditures can be part of the expenses side. If it's part of the expenses side of the budget, fair enough. But like state-owned enterprises and the rest, it's not always part of, also, uh, part of it, right? You always separate them. You may separate them and all that. So this is where things become dicey. The things that we should normally pay from our total revenue or tax revenue, we are beginning to have difficulty. Now we have to borrow to finance those And the things. two big, yes, the two big ones are repayment of the debt, assuming that interest is being covered, the principal element, and then, you know, running government offices. Because remember, you've exhausted your tax revenue or your revenue on only two items, which ordinarily should be. And when you get to these points, you have to pull back. It's like a, right. And so the situation where COVID comes to worsen, you know, makes, it, makes things worse for you, right, requires more belt tightening. Let's go back to household. Yeah. If daddy loses a job, maybe on account of COVID, which is not bringing government to the revenue. a loan to buy a car. Yes. And there's repayment going on. Right. It becomes a big deal. Yes. So you cut down on entertainment, right? Uh, the kids were home on account of COVID, but it's not every crisis that brings the children home. They will continue their schooling. So you prioritize areas where you think. And if you can go to the bank that knows and you are capable, you can go and tell the bank, oh, I'm left with three years to pay. I'm left with two years to pay my loan. But here I am, I don't have, you know, uh, stable, income. stable income. I'm only now helping my wife. And, you know, so they will ask you, so how much do you think you can pay? You negotiate, and then maybe they add another one year. They lower the amount that you have to pay because they've extended. Yes, okay. You know, then, and countries go through the same. You know, so often um, we do the tightening ourselves. But the tightening that has to be done has to be one. Remember, you may not be generating revenue sufficiently, whether because you have a large informal sector or because COVID has hit. As COVID recoveries come. It's like a global financial crisis. It's like when cocoa prices fall. You know, when they start to rise again, then GRA has to do their thing. You know, others who bring in revenue, DVLA and the rest have to do their thing, you know, so that we, we, we come back to a situation where we can meet those expenditures. You know, if you are borrowing to pay interest and you are borrowing to pay debt, old debt, Right. Is that the a people, good thing to do? No. That's when, your debt, that's when your debt becomes unsustainable. Why? Because you are adding to debt. You are not paying it down. And that's why it moves 
from 50% to 60% to 70%, 80%. Right? There's no money in the, in the, within the country. Our revenues barely, we, we are not able to use it, just as you've explained yourself. And, this, and you did indicate yourself as well <clears throat> to n- not to pay for your interest payment when they're due. It's even more dangerous. What else do you expect the government to do? If you that's were where, the finance minister, what would you have done? No, but that's where they borrow. That's where, one, the consequence is that you are borrowing anyway to pay the interest. You go yes. and borrow to pay the interest. You go and borrow, but you are going to the same capital market. You are going to the same, even your banks who are giving you money, you know, uh, treasury bill and the rest on behalf of their savers. You know the situation. <laughs> they read it because the PFM says I should publish this. Since we go to parliament, we are very open. So they know. They know the situation. Everybody is talking about the fact that we are, we are, you know, using so much money to pay two items only. So that's one. Two, you have to pull back. You as a minister of finance has to take a plan, you know, to cabinet and say, I think that we may have to curtail our capital expenditure, the ones which we are, you know, doing ourselves. Uh, we think that let's talk to labor, you know, to see whether uh, instead of 5% or, you know, increase or 6%, can we negotiate with them? Because they are part of the economy. Sure. Can we do, you know, 3% with the expectation that when things come to normal, you know, can we meet our creditors? Remember the household that went to the bank? Let's meet our creditors, right? Then, if they don't see your effort, right, as credible enough, then they say, ah, there is one institution which can tell us they have the expertise and everything, which can tell us, you know, whether you are presenting us with a plan that is credible or not. Which is the IMF. Precisely. That's when you... So sometimes you don't go to the IMF voluntarily. For example, it's all over the place that, you know, personally, uh, I took the... Oh, I, you took Ghana to the IMF. To the IMF and whatever. Yeah, after your homegrown uh, yeah, uh, meeting we, at St. Uh, yes. Some said you people met and after you drank tea, you just uh, said even with your homegrown um, uh, 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 policies, <clears throat> you could not still manage the economy. You decided no, that the IMF uh, I should think, come in and tell us what we should do. No, I think that let's... let's one, remember that we have done 17 at that time, IMF 17 programs. IMF programs. You know, and that is time? from... You know, the post, look, and we have been to the others. It's, it's even repeated that it's an IMF program that resulted in one of the coup d'etat that we had, if you remember. The Buzia. The Buzia. T- yes, t- t- right. Uh, and we have done 17, right. So we'll discuss the IMF. But the real reason, let me just, you know, dispel this notion. Yes, we went to Senchi. We had a discussion. We had a homegrown policy. And because we had oil, we said, let's take matters into our own hands. That's the essence of the homegrown policy. But then we had issues with, you remember, single spine. We had issues with subsidy, which is a, you know, traditional thing, you know, which, you know, normally, you know, happens. I remember we were talking about 2013 and 2014. We were having issues with the lack of flow of gas yeah, from Nigeria from the, uh, Ghana, uh, the, when the, the West Africa the gas, gas pipeline, pipeline yeah. you know, which, cool yes, and we often, exactly, we often forget it because of that one where doom so the cause, right? So we saw ourselves having to, to, to buy crude. I remember at that time, even though we were able to build the stabilization funds and all those things, which was a positive side, we were also buying crude at over $100 per barrel for VRA to generate power. You know, from the normal 55 or 60, you know. And then uh, we had single spine arrears, which we had to, to, to pay. We went to hold. It was taking 70%, the same ratios we are talking about, of tax revenue. Not even what we are talking about today, 126. At the time, it was only taking, by the way, wages alone, plus the arrears. But if you take out the arrears plus interest payments, it was around maybe the same going towards, you know, 90. So we did a homegrown policy, presented it, you know, to the, those who give you grants, right? The development partners, the World Bank and the others, 
because we were uh, grant is a element of our budget. Of, of the budget, yes. Yes, and it at used that to be point, a very huge element. yes, and at that point, the World Bank, in particular, right? I'm not singling them out because the other development partners followed, but they give us the most. The most said until we went into an IMF program. They were not going to. They were not going to give us the grant. I think you have to be pragmatic. <laughs> you have to be pragmatic when you are running a government, right? How are you going to pay your single salary? So How are you going to? Yes. And then we presented a program, and it's then that year we negotiated the IMF program with the homegrown program policy. That's the first time it happened. That's what we put because that was developed with the assistance of the African Development Bank, which, by the way, also withheld <laughs> budget support because they. You know, there's a consensus among the multilateral and bilateral institutions. Right? So yes, we went to the IMF. But it wasn't, what we were going to do was called a policy support instrument. Right? But for me, the lesson from there is... Yes, I was going to come over the lesson for you. Yeah, the lesson from there is for us not to get into that situation. Particularly after we got three oil fields. And that was why we started setting up a stabilization fund. Right? which was already in the PFMA, sorry, PRMA, right? Because the stabilization fund creates savings when the times are good. Remember, crude oil prices were $100 plus and the rest. So we built the stabilization fund, right? We built the sinking fund, which we used to pay off $550 million out of the $750, you know, of the first sovereign bond. It was with our own oil revenue. So we started doing things differently. Right, as required by the PRMA, we created even the seeking fund was our own credit, it wasn't specified in the PRMA, the PFMA, the yeah, PRMA, right, the petroleum revenue. It wasn't. It only said when you cap the stabilization fund, you can use it for the, you might use it for debt management. We went to the construction and for the first time set up, you know, the sinking fund, which is in the construction. And then we set up the contingency fund, and the first use of it was during the Kwame Nkrumah uh, circle, you know, fire and, you know, disaster. And, disaster, and, yes, the, world, disaster, the world, yes. uh, And then the stabilization fund in 2015, when it hit us, we took 250 million Ghana cities to support the budget, first time ever. When COVID came, we took 250 million U.S. dollars. Also from the state. Also from the stabilization fund. That is what you do in order not to go back to the IMF. So if we had probably continued and built these funds, including the infrastructure fund and the rest, we would probably not go to the IMF for the one Are we not building these buffers? No, but we've gone to the IMF already. Remember the RCF for the COVID? Yes. Yes, we could probably have provided it if we had continued from the, from the stabilization fund with three oil fields. But right. we went back to the IMF, right? But one would be charitable in not saying that, you know, you took us back to the IMF. We went back to the IMF. When you pick the expenditure, uh, just to bring us back, uh, because we're looking... At the budget, if you pick the expenditure line by line, do you think? And then I'm, it's going back to my very first question that I had posed to you. Realistic? Should we cancel some of them? Should we still go ahead and want to undertake those expenditures? Would the economy crash I think if, if we don't do any of them? Yeah, we will crash. We will we'll end up with hippie. You can't. You can't maintain you know, the level at which we are going. And I think we should be very realistic about this, right? Because, and let me give you an example. Let me give you facts. Um, I don't recollect all the numbers, right? Last year when we borrowed 3 billion US dollars, we spent 2.2 billion Ghana cities, which is a small amount of money. Yeah. If you divide by even by six, you know, what we're talking about is significant. 2.2 billion, uh, which is around, what, 300 million, thereabouts, on free exchanges. That's, what we, well, that's one of the elements on which we spent. So we, we spent borrow, some more. We borrowed to finance free exchanges. <clears throat> yes. Not infrastructure. Because remember, part of the education infrastructure was being coming from our oil revenue the capital component of the ABFA. Sure. So not, I would say, I wouldn't say totally, but the bulk of it went into 
the normal running of schools. We borrowed for certain initiatives, you know, which is, and these were the submissions that were made to. In essence, we borrowed not to support the capital budget, but to support, you know, elements, elements of recurrent expenditure. Remember which I said, ordinarily you should be borrowing. And it's a look at all these conversations, these elements which we studied. That's why, you know, uh, former President Mahama said he would do a national, uh, uh, like he did with single spine on free SHS. It wasn't ill-conceived. The question is whether this year we are going to the market <clears throat> again. Yeah. The conditions are tougher, right? We say first we'll raise three billion as a nation. Yeah. And if the market conditions are good, are good, we'll go for extra two billion. Yes. And when we were facing those crises, remember that was when we did the bond at ten point three percent, which was you know people still think you know it's very high. Yes, it was high, but the markets were tough with all the conditions which I mentioned. Now, if we get a $3 billion, what are we going to use it for? It's only $1.5 billion that is going to go into the budget. Yeah, one point five is <clears throat> to pay for IRS, interest payments. Yes, interest payments and others, you know. So you are borrowing to pay borrowing costs and amortization. Because remember, our tax revenue is already too small for those two items. Yeah. Right. Part of it will support free SHS, right, and other expenditures. How much of it is supporting infrastructure for that expensive type of borrowing? When we did the refinancing, we started channeling, you know, the bond money into self-financing projects. Okay, so this is the trajectory. Now, we said that we would then, if market conditions were good, we would borrow an additional $2 billion. The truth is that almost all that $2 billion, according to submissions to Parliament, right, is going to go to service debt, to pay existing debt. Remember the debt which, instead of paying down, we were pushing 7 years, 15 years, debt is due, then we talk to the you know, creditors, they are going to earn their interest. So if you want to stretch it, you know, 15 years, 20 years, they will allow you. 40 years, they will allow you. 40 years is how long it took for us to pay for a customer down. Yeah. Right? But the difference is the loan for a customer down was without interest. It was a World Bank and other facets. There was a commercial element, yeah. you know, from the Americans and the rest, which had, but the bulk of it was from the World Bank when we were developing country. The money we are talking about now, even at best, we are paying 6.5% or so. As a rate on it. As a rate on it. So you compare it to, right? So it means that we are, going to, we are going to spend more on interest, not at World Bank rates, but at commercial rates. Commercial stock market rates. rates. Okay. And we are probably refinancing, right? In that existing debt that we want to refinance, we are probably refinancing Debt which, on which we used to pay the same concessionary rates, substituting it for a higher rate. This is why we say it is dangerous for us to compare ourselves to advanced countries that can borrow, you know, at the same capital market, not at 8%, not at 6%, but they can borrow, like Oku bought that sometimes at 2%. At a lower rate. <clears throat> at a lower rate. Because and their, so, their risk yes. assessment shows that they are in a better position than we are. Yes. But let's, let's use our own examples. Borrowing, let's take two dams. Let's take two dams. Right? Borrowing to construct the bulk of the loan from the World Bank and others to construct a customer dam at virtually no interest rate, low interest rate. Let's say maximum plus charges and everything, 2%. Right, when we were a developing country back then, and borrowing at about 8% buy down. See the cost of borrowing? Yeah. Right. Or a trouble. You remember all the dialogue with CDB and the rest, right? And these are our power projects. And so we are saying you cannot 
borrow at 100 and compare yourself with Japan because their percentage of GDP is 100. At what cost is Japan borrowing 100? The cost of their 100 may be 2. The cost of your 100 is 8. It's 8. Your success, I mean, higher yes. than theirs. And their 2 is not making such a terrible impact on their budget. Your 8 is making an impact on your budget already. We all know the numbers now that we are spending our tax revenue. And here we are talking about the interest. And that, is, that together with compensation is what is bringing the tightening now. So you see, if you want to get to that point, you work for it. Okay. You work for it. When you refinance, you use a sinking fund to reduce your debt. To reduce if your you debt. don't reduce your debt, you can push it out 100 years. And I hear, you know, saying we can borrow in perpetuity and pay on the interest. Yes, who wouldn't like to sit down and in, receive In fact, I was going to ask you the question <clears throat> of where we've had government officials um, make the statement that, I mean, you shouldn't just look at the figures in terms of our borrowing, but our ability to pay for our loan, that is what positions us as a better country. And Let's, so the argument has been, look, even if we borrowed, like you said, in perpetuity, if we borrowed uh, in trillions, as long as we can pay and we're able to service these loans, we're in better position. Why are we increasing taxes? Is that ability, the ability to impose taxes on citizens? Of course, we, we also increase taxes, right? But remember, we set up the sinking fund. Remember, those taxes were temporary. They were to go off in three to five years. You know, when we get the trouble, when we get, sorry, it's uh, uh, Tenfield and Sankofa, they are still there, and we're imposing new more taxes. Is the ability to pay? Are we saying that the ability to pay is because of, because we are able to exact, you know, taxes on citizens to repay interest, you know, which we were covering already. Remember, we were covering already. So the ability to pay is being impaired. It's been to, it's being impaired now. By, and that is because by too much borrowing or what? I mean, for, for, the, for, for those much, who are, are watching us, I, I, they wonder, because if you say the ability by to what pay 80, is being impaired, by what and by, by what? How, by how, what, what, 80, what is it? No, by what 80% represents. By moving the, the, the debt ratio, you know, in four years from around 60, which was 57%. To 80. That's what it represents. Yes, borrowing too much. And by, by spending, you know, so much of your revenue, right, to pay two items, which means that you are, are you going to borrow in perpetuity to pay, you know, uh, debt, add on more debt, not pay because you can borrow in perpetuity. A time will come when nobody would give you the money. So I think that. You know, what we need, what we are seeing, and let me wrap up by saying that what we are seeing is we need a correction. But partly because there is difficulty in adjusting the expenditures. In the past, we could adjust the expenditures. Right now, it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Are you going to adjust interest payment, wages? You have not even negotiated, you know, salary increases, right? So everything is being pushed you know, to the revenue side. The one-time payments that we should be making, right, which are backed by ESLA, which is bringing 41 billion, we have converted that also into a loan. So why, what were we doing, what are we doing with the ESLA revenue of 41 billion if the debt owed to contractors, to the energy sector, and then the, and banks, then, and the banks, you know, in total we are told it's about... 20, 21 billion, let's say even 30 billion. And these are the three purposes for which ESLA. You know, so what, what are we you know, borrowing? You know, why are we converting? Because when the first restructuring was done in 2016, when we did the first restructuring in 2016, we paid cash, 250 you know, million, and then we restructured 2 billion, and that was to be paid in cash. And that's what was converted into a loan which means that and stretched to 10 years, which means that ESLA has been extended to 10 years, and therefore 
we are now going to be paying from, you know, extra revenue is coming in. Nobody is saying, but we are increasing extra, which means that the system money, you know, to pay the debt, which for the energy was 2.2 billion US dollars as a result of doing so at the time. Would you agree you know, with those who are saying <laughs> that the country is so broke that, I mean, there's no hope? No, there is hope. If we do the right thing. Where's the hope coming from? Already as, your deficit as, is stretching. We are have, still borrowing. Have you have indicated it. that we, should, we cannot borrow in perpetuity. And it looks have, like we will be going, we'll be calling the, our brothers, the IMF, to even come and do more harm to us you than know, good. You know, there are things that are sometimes politically incorrect, you know, to be talking about and whatever. You know, we need to ask ourselves how much are we paying for single spend? How much are we paying for you know, other presidential initiatives, how much are we, are those the ones that are leading to the expenditure bulging, which is why we are borrowing. I've already said that we are borrowing, by the way, to pay free SHS. This is a conversation that we need to have. And if we have it, and this is a conversation, if we don't have it, if we don't engage in that conversation ourselves and put a credible plan in place, we'll be back with the IMF. Because the people who will be, you know, our bond, the bond we are going to be issuing, the bond itself has to be rated. By who? Rating agencies, yes. Fitch, Moody's, Fitch, Moody's and uh, the rest. SMP and all those Yes, ones. but we know what they have said about our economy. Already, yeah. Yes, and the bond rating is tied to the sovereign rating, and the sovereign rating was downgraded. So these are some of the, the problems that confront you, you know, so if we can present a credible plan to them, you know, we can borrow reasonably, but come home and look at the composition of expenditure and within three years, like we do, and we have the benefit of 17 IMF programs. As I said, we, we did a homegrown pro program which we used to negotiate. So if we, can, if we don't want to go back to the fund, let's just take the benefit of those programs, right? Because that's what countries who don't go to the IMF do, to do their own program. That is where I say, you know, there is hope. If we don't do it, okay. we may end up where we don't want to be. Very, very finally, and then we'll wrap up this conversation. So you've looked at the budget. You've looked at the expenditure plan, all the line items that are within it. If you were the finance minister, what would you drop from it? No, this is not a, this is not a time... You know, because you, we, no, we, we, we should no, cut me, our quota according to our size. Yes, let me explain. Because I'm sure the viewer is sitting and saying, okay, guys, why don't we just cut something out of this no, budget and go? Let me, why are we worrying ourselves? Let, let, me, let me explain, please. If you are able to get the money to finance this year's budget, don't take it as respite. Take it as respite in another sense to allow you to plan for the next three years to look at the embodiment, the revenue that's going to come from the taxes that we have increased, to look at the expenditures, you know, which are on the books, you know, which we may not be able to remove today, the refinancing that we are going to do. Less, if crude oil prices go up, COVID recovery comes, right? Let's put part of that money to start repaying the debt, as we did with the first sovereign bond, because we're getting to that unsustainable. Remember, on the old basis, we are 70% when we left office. On the new basis, it's 57. And it's on that new basis that we are at 80, which means that we have gone 10 percentage points. Right. So I'm saying, let us take it as an opportunity, you know, a respite, that especially if we can raise you know, the, you know the, 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 the loans to support this year's budget. We need to do more on the expenditure side, and I don't see that much of that in the mid-term expenditure you know, framework or the mid-term budget framework. That is what work we have to do, to convince the Moody's and the rest who will be rating it, because we'll go back to the market next year under our current condition to pay. Let's hope that we'll borrow a lesser amount to pay those expenditure items so that we can have some money for development.
That is that is what the situation is. Very well. Thank <laughs> you very much, um, Mr. Setepe. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching the PFM Tax TV. Uh, my name is Novan Akwahifo. I've been speaking to uh, Mr. Setepe, as I did indicate to you, who is the Executive Director for PFM Tax uh, Network Africa. And... Um, We've been looking at expenditure and arrears. But you realize that getting to the end, we dovetailed into debt management. So our next, um, our next time that we come your way, we will be going detail into debt management, how we can do it, how it should be done. What's the current situation for us as a country? And what are the things that we should do? You heard him. If things are not done right, we will find ourselves again with our brothers, the ILF. Remember, when they come, that is when you have to tighten your belt. When they come, job creation becomes an issue. When they come, there are a lot of things that happen within the economy, and we don't want such a thing. We want to be able to take our own destiny into our own hands, manage this economy well, so that things can be done better. 2021 budget breakdown will continue in our next presentation, when we come your way again or we come into your homes or your cars or wherever you are. But until then, we will say, enjoy yourselves, but remember that we have a nation to build. If you haven't taken the job, please go for it. The COVID vaccine is important to rebuild the economy for us to bring back the life that we used to have. Until then, thank you very much. <laughs>